Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Wayne Callen, and you're listening to the third of our four ADHD Awareness Month webinars that Attitude is hosting during October. Today's webinar is devoted to women moving out of the shadows of undiagnosed ADHD and the confusion and shame that goes along with it, and moving toward realizing their gifts and strengths and needs. Lots of women write in explaining that getting a diagnosis is like coming out of the tunnel, seeing themselves in their life from a new perspective. They have a clearer sense of self, and they get in touch with the dreams and goals, which have been on hold for what seems like forever. Today, Sari Solden will give us strategies and support for the journey from shame and doubt to acceptance and success, however you want to define that word. Sari has been working with adults, mostly women, in her private practice in Ann Arbor, Michigan for 30 years. She is the author of Women with Attention Deficit Disorder and a top speaker on ADHD throughout the world. If you're new to our webinars, post your questions on, in the box at the right of your screen. Sari will give a presentation and then she'll take questions for the rest of, of the time remaining. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Sari. Oh, well, hello, everybody. I'm Sari Solden, and it's lovely to be with you again here. Thanks, Wayne. Um, yeah, the Happiness Project's a wonderful name. I didn't come up with it, but I have spent 30 years working with women with ADHD, moving forward, helping them move forward without shame or doubt. So I love the name that Attitude has given me to talk about today, and I think it's a wonderful, whatever your politics is, definitely in the air, Commander-in-Chief, for women, it's in the air, it's in all of our lives, and if we can learn to do that in our own life, that's certainly going to lead us to become a strong and confident woman with ADHD. Um, and to do that, we have to overcome the stigma about women with ADHD and these differences, external stigma, but even more importantly, the internal stigma that we've all internalized when we're growing up with these differences. So. Just as an overview today, I will be talking about how women and also girls with ADHD often grow up undiagnosed, and because of that, internalized painful and often confusing feelings that lead them to withdraw often from relationships and lose sight of their gifts as they grow. And they often do, as Wayne said, put their hopes and dreams on hold. Today we'll talk a little bit about how to redefine who you really are, even though you have these organizational or attentional difficulties, to really come to terms with what does it mean to be a successful woman. To do that, you have to stop waiting until you're all organized and learn to move in a bold new direction, even if it's just one small step at a time. We'll talk about the importance of focusing on or rediscovering your unfulfilled dreams and, just, and creating a life to move forward to that's compelling, to move forward to instead of being a slave to your to-do list and making that the organizing principle of your life instead of unleashing who you are. This will bring up a need to set boundaries off and communicate to the people closest to you. We'll also touch on how you can use these same values and ideas when you're helping a little girl maybe in your life to become a strong and confident woman with ADHD make sure I can move my slide there. So the take, uh -oh. just give me a minute here to go back. Go. So the takeaway message is really to start to soar like that first woman in that picture. The goal for women is to lead satisfying lives, not to become a different kind of person like you see in that second picture, the idea is not to be, not to get over who you are, not to get over all your symptoms but to be able to soar and have a free life no matter if you still are struggling with some of your challenges. I put the slide up there to show that it starts off early on when you're starting to develop a sense of who you are. It's very difficult without a diagnosis and without someone guiding you or explaining your unusual experiences of yourself to form a cohesive sense of self. Sometimes you're getting good feedback, sometimes you're getting negative feedback, and without understanding what's going on, it's very difficult to, to form this idea that's going to lead you to be a strong and confident woman. Many girls aren't diagnosed because they're difficult to recognize, they're not causing trouble, 
they are not fitting any stereotype of a hyperactive little boy. And as they grow up, they often conclude to themselves this must be something to do with a character flaw. Women and girls, they often hit a wall later, and this is how they feel by the time they hit that wall. But at some point, whether it's college or marriage or children or a job, the multiple demands on their attentional systems exceed their capacity at some point. Often girls at some point lose structure and support. Many have had them had, had up until then. And by then, this distortion or narrow view of themselves, this guilt and shame has already taken root in them. Often they don't get diagnosed until they're often depressed or anxious and still missing their primary diagnosis of attentional difficulties. So today we're focusing on what prevents and then what makes us become strong and confident women. So I'm going to focus on this accommodation that girls learn to do easily to try to fit in. They often feel less than other people and they just are so different again without knowing why. Ironically, sometimes they have greater abilities than many of these girls that they're trying to fit in with, but without guidance they can't see what's valuable in them, even if it's different from other people. So a narrative starts to develop early on, and a negative or distorted or narrow ne narrative about how they don't fit in. And so as they grow up, anything that happens that fits with that negative narrative is just taken in and other maybe positive experiences are just discarded. So this wounding as they're growing up is, is taking root and growing. They're not getting any validation for their differences, and they just start hiding um, and withdrawing often, often and intensify their desire to conform, their effort to conform, and compare themselves in toxic ways with other girls. And as they grow up, that leads to women doing the same thing as it affects their choices of who to be in a relationship with, how to be treated in relationships, and how to, how to what kind of contributions they feel they're able to make in the world. So I want to focus on that people-pleasing because people-pleasing girls learn really early on, especially girls who are sort of passing for normal, who are inattentive and not causing trouble. It's one common way that girls and then women learn to compensate and in order to avoid negative feedback. They try to conform in order to not expose themselves to more pain. If they can sort of slip through the cracks, become invisible or over accommodate other people's needs, they give up their own sense of control, they say yes all the time. These things start early where they start to put aside their own needs um, and they begin to internalize their feelings that lead to depression or anxiety instead of acting them out. And I added this uh, quote I have in my waiting room. It's by Rebecca West, a writer from very early uh, century, who she says, people call me a feminist whenever I express uh, sentiments that distinguish myself from a doormat. I was like that. So, <laughs> I to put that in there because uh, women often who have needs to express with ADD who have to get help um, f feel like, oh, I'm going to be high maintenance, or people are going to think I'm, you know, too selfish or too too much when I start to say what I need. So. Girls who grow up with organizational problems have a lot of difficulty when they're not understood. Not only is this kind of self-image embedded in them, not only is their expecta expectations for negative feedback embedded in them, which lead them to avoid people um, when they're going to be having organizational problems, but, but it's very hard to break out of this idea, and this is the main thing women come in to see me about they're, with this idea that they're going to wait until their organizational problems are all fixed before they let themselves enjoy their life or move to a fulfilling life because they were told when they were girls that they can't go out to play until all their work is done and they couldn't figure out why they couldn't figure out how to organize, how to clean up their room and they what, couldn't figure out why their work was never done and they, they keep this mindset as they grow up. Their executive functions, which have to do with this organizing, with activating, with, with prioritizing, synthesizing, pulling things together, all those kind of difficulties collide with these, by the time they grow up, these gender role expectations they've absorbed throughout the years. And this collision increases when they lose their structure and support that many of them may have had as a girl. And so 
everything that women do, whether they have children or not, or families or not, even at work, there these social niceties, this idea of pulling it together, maintaining friendships, all that is very difficult for women. And so the idea of this um, self-image that you see in front of you, this overwhelm, plus this internalization of what they should be able to do is there, plus the fact that all women are exposed to these cultural messages and women with ADD are no different. It's just that when women with ADHD can't, can't say what they need because of some of these messages that they've absorbed, that becomes even adds another layer of how difficult it is to ask for what they need. They feel way too vulnerable. These are cultural messages about be nice, help others, don't say no, don't ask for too much, don't hurt anyone's feelings, don't set limits on projects, don't try to get out of work by asking for special favors. I mean, you have you know, women who even have a door on their office who won't close it because they think, oh, other people will think that they think that they're better than them. So this is takes hold. So you have all these levels going on for women. And what they do in terms of this book, wanting to present well, they start to over and over organize, overwork, isolate, all the time underachieving but working over and over time, putting themselves on hold, putting any fun or enjoyment or nurturing activities on hold because I say, how can I let myself, you know, take time for myself or do fill in the blank while all this other stuff is undone, but they're getting more and more depleted. The compensation itself takes up so much more of their time. So let's look at then how the purpose today, the happiness project, how can we begin to heal those old wounds? What has to happen? How do I look at it? Well, once women have been diagnosed and treated, then it's uh, even when they get correctly diagnosed and treated, it's then of vital importance for women to learn to move toward a life where they put themselves front and center, even though they still have these challenges. These are this has to sort of be on a parallel track to, to who you are at core as a person. You can't let this define who you are. These women need you out there, women need to learn to form satisfying relationships with people who can see you and value you for who you are. And goal is to, to get support that can help you stop waiting until you're completely organized or until all the needs of everybody else has been taken care of, care of so you can go on to create a life. It might be a non-traditional path, but it has to be a path toward fulfillment. Because the way I see it is, you know, executive function and your difficulties with it can't define you. Of course, like some people think, oh, if you get over that, then you'll feel good about yourself. Well, of course, that might be true, but you might never get over the challenges. You probably won't of executive function. And you have to have a fulfilling life anyway by getting support or structure or moving towards something important. To talk a little bit about a composite client, Sue, who was about 60 and all of her life she took care of her family. She put her early dreams of teaching writing and literature on hold while she took care of her family. She was a very gifted person. She left college in the middle, she got married, and she let go of those dreams of teaching literature, of reading, of writing, and all of her efforts, all of her efforts. I mean, maybe 10, 12 hours a day she spent doing things that she was just not good at. She let herself from the brunt of jokes in her family and she just good naturedly sort of took that as she spent hours trying to prepare these family meals and to go shopping and to clean up and to cook and really put herself on hold and now at this age in her 60s her kids were growing up her husband was tired she had time and the capability of focusing on herself but she had no permission internal permission that she could give herself to do that instead of getting up every day and just berating herself for how much she wasn't getting organized. So focusing on the core of who she was and helping her reawaken her dreams and reshape her early dreams. You can't always go back and she couldn't always go back and become a college professor maybe at that point, but there was a lot of ways she could reshape those dreams and identity and move toward a fulfilling life. We'll talk about Because otherwise, sometimes what happens with treatment, you just get bombarded with all these ways you should improve yourself, all these strategies you should do, and all those things are fine. Strategies are good, getting support for your difficulties, but that has to, again, be parallel to this track of, of building around you, your core, letting you express who you are, getting back to your life, 
and, and not getting lost because that could just be just as overwhelming. The real goal for women often when they come to treatment is to begin to, and this is a long-term thing, sometimes it takes a while depending on where you're starting, but to be able to redefine actually for yourself what it means to be a competent, successful, mature woman, even if you still have these symptoms. You have to start to ask yourself, like, who are you if you can't do those things well? And for women, that's really hard to do, but it's important to stop and really think, what, what makes me a woman? What makes me who I am? And what's important about that instead of what women often do is this toxic comparing themselves to other women. What I would have you do is start evaluating your success not by what you see around you, because if you could see what was around me, you would say, I shouldn't be letting myself do a webinar right now. You can't, you have to have, <laughs> you have to have, luckily there's no video cameras, but you have to let yourself evaluate yourself also by inside, internal markers of how do you view yourself now? Is that changing? Is that growing in a positive way? Do you feel a sense of vitality returning to your life instead of being defeated or depleted? Do you feel more authentic in relationships instead of hiding who you are from other people and pretending? Do you feel that you're moving toward more satisfaction in relationships but also in your work or in your contribution, um, development of your talents or skills or at least the ability to begin to even develop and understand what those are? One way that you have to start to do that, which you're doing right now, is this identification. You have got to find other women who are like you in some important ways. Often starting with ADD women is a good way um, because often what I see happening is either online here or through books, you know, hopefully in person, even in your own community, you can see and hear clearly when you hear women describing the same struggle you have, but you can also see them in a more whole way. You can see they have all these amazing gifts or this personality that you like or this sensitivity or however whatever strengths you can't see in yourself you can often see in other people so this is very important to have an identification with a group so this is great that you're starting now you have to also instead of just spending your life figuring out how to get organized you have to start building toward meaning and strengths and helping your girls whether they're ADD or not obviously developing this. So if they don't fit in, they always say girls, girls who can fit in will fit in. So if, if you have a daughter who can't fit in, you know, to help her discover what her strengths are and who she is and gear her toward activities where she can use her strengths is going to be so important for you as a woman to be able to and help or help your daughter tell yourself a more complete story to integrate all these disparate parts of yourself that haven't made any sense to be able to fit this all in a whole, to be able to say, you're more than one thing. I have trouble with maybe with organization. I have piles and I'm an amazing friend, or I have you know trouble being on time, but I'm a very creative person. All these different things are not either or, they're all part of yourself, and your goal is to start experiencing more successes and more experiences of yourself as a valuable person, being with people who can see you more getting some better feedback about yourself so that you can start to say, you know, it's a little crazy, it's a long stretch, I'm so good at this and I'm so, I have such difficulty with that, but that's all part of me. But as the core, you are you as a person and none of them define yourself. And just building to this idea that starting early on when you were a child, maybe when you started trying to be more perfect and you thought that was a way to, you know, overworking and, and, and so you could avoid some negative criticism. But girls move into women who hold on to this idea of perfection and measure themselves against some crazy idea of what's perfection. And I always say women with ADD, not, we're all familiar with body shame, but girls and women have what I call brain shame. And so you're comparing yourself to other people who think differently than you do. And and that just keeps you stuck. And women, just like girls did, may start working harder and harder and harder. And even when you're starting to take steps, you often start to measure your success by some ideal and, and goal. It's great to have a vision out there, but you have to start measuring your success by your ability to start moving step by step toward in the right direction, not by some ideal to now. Because even when women start to move towards something, 
they're still berating themselves that they're not there yet. You have to move from this idea of perfection instead to an ideal of wholeness where you, where I am all of this, not just over focusing on your challenges, but not just over focusing on your talents, just also I am me and I have all these attributes and start letting in new information and new experiences of success because you know women are sort of drowning I would say I know I'm in here somewhere you're in there you're lost under those piles and you feel like you're drowning we want to get you up from under those piles you know even when I send an organizer into somebody's house like Sue for instance I was talking about I, I won't let them just spend all their time making files I mean I want Sue, for instance, to create a sanctuary in her home with the organizer, organizer who specializes in severe and chronic disorganization, to create a space in her life as a sanctuary, that's a writing space, to get back to a place to explore and to be herself. Not everybody has a whole room in her house, but to find some space where it's just yours and where the point of that is to go in there and, and not just struggle with organization, but to have a sanctuary and a place to think and discover yourself or to build on your talents. So when you have help with organizing, I always encourage you to do that for a reason, with a, a vision or a goal that's compelling to move toward, not just to spend your life getting organized. You never want to schedule yourself out of your own life. So that's why I say to do, that should be to do, to be with people you love, to, to, to do something you're good at, to enjoy yourself. This is what I want to focus on now when they wanted me to talk about this goal of, of women moving away from guilt and shame and letting them have, enjoy their life. You know, there's a Bill of Rights um, that I have in one of my books that even if you have, an ADD, have ADD, you need to be treated with respect, even though you're late, even though you're disorganized, even though you have piles, that doesn't give people the right to treat you with disrespect. And a lot of women will conflate those two and say, well, you know, I, I do have these problems. I am a problem. I am bothering people. So I let them treat me however they want to. Somehow I deserve it. So the main thing is you have to allow yourself to be Again, because of who you are as a person, a respected, per a valued person, you need to be able to not accept toxic help in your life. A lot of people say, well, I need the help, and so I let, you know, my mother say, how can you live like this when she helps me, you know, or what's wrong with you, yeah, like a two-year-old. That, you have to be able to work with somebody enough to be able to set boundaries and say that's not okay and, and get help in other ways and not just accumulate a lot of negative messages in an effort to get help no matter what. You have to ask yourself and understand what kind of family messages did you get? What did you learn about differences growing up? In some households that was dangerous if you felt different or acted different or said different things. And what were your messages about asking for help? Sometimes people feel, women feel too vulnerable to ask for help. And it's great to model to children that we that we value diversity, that we accept differences, and we accept in difficulties and we can ask for help with it. We can model interdependence where I'm not good at taking you for school shopping, but Aunt Susie can take you for that, but I can help you with your essay or whatever your talent is to show people that we can't all do everything and nobody's completely independent of other people. But for girls, whether that if you're raising young people, whether they have ADD or not, what a great thing to be able to model that, you know, that you don't have to be ashamed of your body or your brain or that you don't fit in, that you can shine. Um, and to teach communication that, that doesn't characterize yourself in a negative way so you can protect yourself and still not have to move away from other people. So being able to say thank you for being so patient for if someone's helping instead of sorry I'm so dumb. So really emphasizing your strengths, emphasizing your value in your communication is really something to pay attention to and to monitor. The message you want to get across in your communications as a strong and confident woman is you're important and I'm important, not one or the other. And that's what you're shooting for in all your relationships. You know, even though you have ADHD or challenges, everybody does. They're just different challenges. So 
what a lot of my women are really saying to me is they want a permission slip. Basically, I was thinking of printing one up because so many people say, really, what I just need, it turns out that what I just needed was permission to take time for myself, even though my work isn't done. It goes so deeply back to those early messages of I can't go out and play. And actually, it sounds counterproductive, but if you let yourself enjoy yourself and take time for yourself or do things that are you know, part of your strengths or your talents, that will give you more energy um, to actually attempt some of these other tasks that are more difficult. But, but in any case, you're building up this other side of yourself in positive psychology. You know, you're always reminded not to spend all your time just focusing on your challenges, not time fixing everything that's wrong, but focusing on what's strong is what positive psychology would tell you. And that's so applicable here. Um, what I finally told Sue was about, and this is an image that I really like because these are words that coming up the other day in my session with this uh, woman was instead of guilt and shame to, to develop new habits of pleasure. Actually, these are words that women with ADD are afraid of, fun. Uh, they just can't let themselves stop, you know, berating themselves. And but it, I, I even encourage you to keep like a pleasure diary because it's so foreign to you. You can't just kill off everything in you that's alive. You have to nurture it. And these words were coming to me that are foreign to women with ADD about luxuriate is you know just to indulge yourself, enjoy, focus on pleasure. But this stuff is going to give you you know such more energy to to focus on some of these really difficult challenges that you have to. Those are challenges that are going to be difficult and you have to get support and structure and help for them, but they can't become your whole life. And if you let yourself bathe sort of in these other kinds of states uh, and enjoy yourself and connect to people and have fun, uh, you'll have more energy. So you want to let yourself dream again like you did as a little girl. That's where we're going to be innovative and entrepreneurial and, and have all sorts of um, dreams again and, and not spend your whole time just knocking your head against a wall or defeating yourself. I always tell people you can't fight your brain. It will always win. So you have to respect what your brain will do, when it will do it, how hard it, you can push it and work with it, befriend it, get to know it. and. And you can't shame yourself into a new kind of performance. You have to sort of nurture yourself and, and be kind to yourself. This woman I was talking about, Sue, she eventually, you know, step by step with some help and support, went back to take a, a literature class and began reading again. She became a tutor eventually in literacy, helping people who couldn't read. She joined a writing group and she stopped letting herself be the brunt of jokes in her family. She got back to her core talents and what made her feel alive. In other words, she changed her narrative into eventually into I'm a creative person who has trouble with organizing, but she realized she was not going to spend the rest of her life trying to become someone else. She just started moving slowly in the right direction in order to become a strong and confident woman with ADHD. So in this election cycle, I can only encourage you to become Step, take steps to become the commander in chief of your own life, and <clears throat> others will take their cue from you. You know, people are always surprised when they say, "Oh, well, I took all these steps and I set these boundaries, and then everybody in my life changed." It was because they're taking their cues from you. And I'm just going to end with this little quote from Maya Angelou, who is a little. There's a great poem she wrote called "Phenomenal Woman." I'm just going to read you the last paragraph of it. Now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say it's in the click of the heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need for my care, as I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. So you can contact me through my website at sarisolden.com, which is also going live today. You can also look at soldenfrank.com because my associate, Dr. Michelle Frank, has now become my partner. You can reach us either way or just write me at Siri at sarisolden.com. And now I think we're ready for questions. That was a terrific presentation. Really Thank excellent. You. Thank Sarah. you. Um, 
This is a great first question. Um, I am 60 years old and so ashamed that I can't keep a clean house or learn other everyday habits. I am too embarrassed to get help because I'm afraid of judgment and rejection. I have no follow through even though I'm taking medication. Shame and guilt is overwhelming my life. Thanks for any support you can provide. I know that's a big well, question, but... <laughs> well, I mean, it's funny. It's exactly the it's, it's it. same story I just told her about Sue, who is 60, and I'm seeing more and more women, actually, around the age of 60. Often this new stage of life brings back some of these issues, or often a husband's retirement or their retirement, puts them into a state of panic, some of their old strategies for hiding and aren't working anymore, and they start to naturally reevaluate where they are at this stage of your life. Medication supplies the fuel, you know, so that you can start to take steps, which is great. And diagnosis, hopefully, can give you more explanation, but you need to often, by the time you're at this age, work with somebody who can, um, a coach or a, a therapist, or somebody who really understands, respects women with these kind of struggles. So it's pretty hard to do this alone, first of all. I would either Make sure you have a support system, a support group, something online so that you can start to hear the stories of other women. Like I said, the shame and guilt is overwhelming just because of, I mean, you sort of summed up the whole talk that I just gave, the lifetime of viewing yourself through a negative lens and this insistence that you get over your organizational problems. I don't know your, you know, your, your situation in depth, but Often you're going to need either a professional organizer who specializes in ADD or an assistant or a family member, some, but you can't just do it alone. So you need to find the safest, most supportive person either professionally or in your life if you can't afford that or find that to be with you, to help you start to move away from spending your rest of your life only in your area of difficulties and to carve out a space to rediscover or discover for the first time who you really are and and find something exciting, compelling to move for, then it's going to be a lot easier to organize those activities. Spending eight hours a day in things you're not good at isn't going to help you do them any better. And, and the energy and the self-esteem that you're going to get from finding something, you know, about who you are is going to help you. So. If I hope that's helpful. You can always email me for more information, more specific to your story. Uh, you had mentioned, Sari, that uh, you have a new website where people can well, reach I, you. So yeah, well, they can if they go to sarisolden.com, they'll reach me also. But just mm -hmm. happens to be today that we're also it hasn't been redirected yet. But if you go to soldenfrank.com, that's our new website. You can go to either of them and uh, okay. and find me. Okay. Um, one now. woman asked, uh, so many experts recommend forgetting about the piles of stuff at home and going out to pursue your dreams. What if your dream is taking care of those piles? <laughs> <laughs> ever since I, That's a great question. <laughs> ever since I was a child, I have found that being in a neat environment is very calming, even though the noise in my brain seems louder by contrast. But how can I uh, accomplish neat? That's what they want to know. Which, in, well, you know, that's true. I mean, people with ADD, the irony is they need a neat environment more than other people. They need a neat, calming environment. That's why to function. So that is a difficulty. And uh, the problem is that it becomes a compulsion and, a, and a supersedes all their goals because you just feel like if you could just get that completely neat, um, then you'd be able to go on. And if you have severe problems in this area, or often you do when you have executive function problems, you often need somebody to help you and to think about being organized just enough instead of being organized perfectly. And to, it becomes its own kind of, it sucks you into a life pursuing something for its own end rather, unless you want to become a professional organizer. I mean, then you, then, I mean, you could do that. I mean, if that, if you're great at that and you really want to help other people, you could turn that into something. But just for its own sake, I think Howell always says, you know, you just have to be well enough organized. And I always say, I, it's amazing. People have all these organizational problems, but, uh, but when something compelling happens, you know, I know somebody who wanted to clean up her office in, in, for like 10 years, and then she got this job where she needed to work at home, and she was excited about it, and she cleaned up her office like in about a day. So with ADD, you have to have a really exciting, compelling reason to, not just for motivation, but to 
your mind will be able to figure things out more when you have a big purpose involved in that. So be a professional organizer or uh, get someone to help you get organized to do whatever else it is you're good at or want to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Several people have asked since you brought up the whole professional organizer thing. Um, how do how do they find them? Okay, well, there's well, I recommend I recommend this Institute for Challenging Disorganization. So I, I wouldn't recommend just getting an organizer. These are people who are especially trained in helping people with ADD or hoarding, but people who have special needs, people who have severe and chronic disorganization. If you go to that website, which I don't have offhand, it's probably ICD something, but you can look it up by. Institute for Challenging Disorganization, and they have a great national training program for and different levels of certification, and you can go to it, and then they have like a, a place where you can put in a, your zip code, and it'll t it bring up the websites or descriptions of people in your area, and you can look at, do you think that's a good fit? But I really recommend those people, because you need somebody who's not going to just tell you to put everything away in black hole files. You, know, you need somebody who's going to help you organize the way you want to and for your purposes. Mm -hmm. And who's neutral and kind and sensitive and understanding and knowledgeable. Right. Right. Uh, another woman asked, I was not diagnosed till I was 25. How can doctors, why didn't doctors notice mm -hmm. it before? Yeah, it's so sad. You know, that's what I was talking about earlier that girls Girls who are not hyperactive often get missed, and that's what causes all the difficulties later. If they missed it because you're not, you often don't meet a stereotype of the hyperactive little boy they're looking at. Maybe you're smart. Maybe you were compensated for by a family who was supportive or structured, and maybe you were just not letting anybody know about those difficulties because you were internalizing your feelings. So maybe you didn't hit a wall until much later, and so by then, you often get diagnosed with depression or anxiety or something else, and then you can even go on for many more years not getting diagnosed with the primary ADD. So uh, hopefully we're doing better now of having people understand little girls and women, uh, but but it's so common to, when you're an inattentive woman or a little girl to, to especially if you're smart, to have all these uh, things masked and and not be identified till much later. Um, there's a woman in her late 50s who says she still gets viciously, viciously criticized by her 95-year-old father. Do you suggest making a statement educating him about ADHD or just avoid him? I've been avoiding him for three years. I didn't see that. <laughs> well, you know, it's hard to know. It depends what you want. I mean, if, he, if this was a very toxic relationship in general and you know, then probably this is not going to go well either. But if it if it's a relationship that you want to heal and to you know finish out this stage of life together in a closer way, I just had a client do this with her with her aging parent. It was very healing because often your parents, older parents, will not have known what was going on, and often there's a lot of hurts and a lot of wounds from not being understood or being scolded or misunderstood or not valued. So if in general it's a safe and loving relationship or even a relationship that you want to heal before you lose your parent uh, and and it's not toxic in some other way that I don't know about, then um, I would start to make statements not to blame or to go back and revisit it but maybe and not maybe just give a book but to start talking about your challenges. I always ask people to describe their difficulties rather than just broadly, you know, characterize them. So I say, you know, I, I've had, I don't know if you know this, I've had trouble my whole life with these things and now I understand it's just about my brain being wired differently. I'm actually being treated for that now. I want you to understand because it would, so that I could feel closer to you. I, want, I would love to be able to tell you what life was like for me and what it's still like for me. And, you know, so, I mean, the name of ADD could come later, but I would start with more of a opening up. And have you ever had those? Often, you know, this is genetic. So, you know, with any issue with an aging parent, you know, to be able to them to talk about their experiences too would be maybe informative and healing for everybody. Mm -hmm. so. uh, this woman actually brings up relationships. My spouse has been on the breaking point of our relationship and it has really been hard on my already low self-esteem. How do I begin rediscovering myself and saving my relationship at the same time? I think you have to, 
again, I don't know the level of difficulty. Um, I Sometimes it's the difficulty in the relationship that's making ADD worse. Sometimes it's just the ADD making it difficult. So you have to sort of see where it's coming from, what's the biggest issue there. But I mean, in general, I think discovering yourself first helps because you can't really describe who you are, what you need, what he can help you with. You can't really hold your own in an argument even or in a conflict. You know, you often, women often back down. They feel overpowered. They're not able to express themselves. So making sure that you feel strong, whether, you know, checking on your brain, medication, support, understanding your value first and getting some coaching and communicating clearly what you need and feeling sure about that, you know, not wobbly about that, really, really owning that these are challenges that don't define you, that often is really pivotal and then being able to go on to enter into either couples counseling or to be able to communicate in a clear way with your partner. So I would start with that, if at all possible, getting that kind of help for yourself and getting clear about your own challenges. Sometimes women just want their husbands to understand them or help them when they don't really know what it is they need help with. And then the problem is that often men or partners see you in a global way rather than saying, okay, you, you know, she has trouble with this, but she doesn't have trouble with this. You want people to be able to see your competency and what you're good at but it's very hard to understand, oh, I just need help with these things or in this way. So the more you know about how you operate and the more you feel entitled to say it, you know, because you feel better about yourself, the easier it's going to be with your partner. That's a good answer. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> does uh, medication help this whole journey of self-discovery? Can it help? Yeah, I think it does. It's often like the foundation. Not everybody wants to take medication, but for people who have unique brain wiring, who have neurobiological stuff at the root, um, trying medication, obviously needing to find a medication that feels good, that makes it easier for you to be you, that makes it you not feel weird or not like yourself. You want to find medication that's just, and for women, often it's a very low dose of something. Women often don't like medication because they're often getting too much medication. Often a lot of women need very small doses, not everybody, but some women, you know, it's just not the right dose or the right medication, so you need to try different things and find somebody who can help you. But often it gives you that extra little spark, the extra fuel, the extra activation, often for women just to get out of bed, to be able to feel alive, alert, awake to be able to put sentences together, to be able to express yourself, to stay in a, a discussion with a stronger, more verbal person often, to not get overwhelmed, all those things, you know, and to have clarity of thought, to be able to sit down and work with somebody to figure out what you want to do, to, to move from thought to action, to not just sit on the couch and be overwhelmed. Yes, I guess I'm saying medication, if it's the right kind and the right dose, at least at the beginning of this journey, can help you set up a life that's a much better fit for you. Um, yeah, because you need mm -hmm. something to get you out of the, you know, the distress, the inner distress and the overwhelm and the being inundated, bombarded with so many things, just to be able to have clarity of thought to figure this all thing out. Very good. Um, someone asked, I was recently diagnosed with ADHD at 38. The thing is, I try to be compassionate with others when they make mistakes but I am my own harshest critic. I don't know how to stop being so judge judgmental of myself. I've done it all my life. Would cognitive behavioral therapy help with this habit? Yeah, I mean, you described something that I talked about in this presentation, that that's a much bigger enemy, much bigger adversary, much more difficult thing to live with than ADD. I always tell people, like, if at the end of the day you're just living with ADD, you're doing great because is adding all this extra weight and self berating and judging yourself in this negative kind of way that's leading to this more complete downward cycle. So, um, you know, I don't, I believe whoever it is you go to, whether they define themselves as cognitive behavioral therapists or other kind of therapists, they have to be somebody who, who is not, who you don't feel judged by, who you see, feel can see you and help you you know, move into a life that works for you. Because it's not just cognitive, it's not just, you just can't talk yourself into out of this. I think you have to really be able to view this from a way that's 
that's different, view this in a way that understands that this does, is not all about who you are as a person and enlarges your view of yourself. So you just have to make sure that you feel that that's what's happening, whoever you're seeing. Obviously, you have to start to say new things to yourself, but I believe you also need new experiences of yourself. So anything that's going to lead you to start to have an experience slowly with other people or in the world that's going to actually make you feel differently about yourself is sort of a balance between action and acceptance. You know, you have to, you're working on acceptance. That doesn't mean resignation. It means accepting, okay, I got these issues, I got these challenges, but that's not all of who I am. So cognitive learning to change your thoughts and understand those negative thoughts you have is an important part of the therapy, but, you know, it's not everything either. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, right. it's a little bigger than that for someone who um, has thought this their whole life. It's pretty ingrained, and so, but it, so we're finding someone to work with who can really help you view yourself in a, in, a, in a nicer, more positive way and help you take some action toward getting some new experiences is also important. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth has a question. She asks, I often hear the advice, follow your dreams or do what you love. <laughs> I've always had a hard time knowing what those dreams are. I get very interested in something for a while and think it's my passion but then I eventually get bored and lose interest. How do you right. suggest getting past this to find a meaningful direction in life? Right, that, that's a problem. You know, some women, they, uh, they have no idea what they want when you ask them that. Some women have knew what they want but let it go, and that's sort of a little easier in a way because you can just sort of help them rediscover that and give them permission and support them, but it's a little harder for what, what Elizabeth's talking about because, you know, she's never well, she might not have known exactly what she wanted, or she can't stick with one thing and really make that the center of her life. So, um, so sometimes this is where coaching with the right person can come in. You know, there's coaching and therapy; how they fit together is a whole other issue. But, but if it's if you feel okay about yourself and aren't loaded down with shame or doubt and are ready to start to have somebody help you move step by step maybe towards staying with one of these dreams, at least to pursue it and move toward a, a new path, then a really highly trained ADD coach. Um, and you can again write to me. And, I, and the nice thing is, you know, these people are all over the world. I mean, they work on the phone or online. So, I, you know, I have some people that I like to refer to. So if you're at the right place in your life, it's not that coaching is always the right way to start. Sometimes that's harder. Sometimes you have to start more from within and get and be in a place where you allow yourself to, to move to, away from the shame and doubt and negative feelings about yourself. But if you're at the right place, sometimes an ADD coach can help you, Elizabeth, stay on track toward moving toward one of these things and help you discover even what it is that you want to move toward. A bunch of people have asked you to repeat that organization organization for ADHD or so you don't have to give the website but just right. okay it's the Institute for Challenging Disorganization ICD I'm just not sure if it's dot net dot org whatever but it or dot com but it's Institute for Challenging Disorganization again you can write me at Sari at SariSolden.com if you can't find it okay uh, another woman asked can you recommend online communities of women working to overcome their ADHD and provide mutual support. Okay, well, I don't like to say overcome, first of all, because this is your brain and, you know, I don't want you to become a different person. So, but if you want help and support in, in uh, managing your difficulties and supporting each other, um, well, I'll, there's this uh, Queens of Distraction, I understand, is a good website. It's by Terry Matlin, I mean, an online group. Uh, Queens of Distraction, where Terry wrote the book by the same name. Um, you can look that up. Um, and uh, in terms of support group, you know, we had this festival here last year called Better Together Fest, and we brought women together from all over the world uh, to celebrate their gifts. And my colleague, Dr. Frank, now has, well, right now it's a group that's um, sort of sometimes meets in person, sometimes meets online, but we're moving toward a time where we're just going to be able to have an online group too, so you can ask me about that or look into Queens of Distraction. Um, those are the two that come to mind right now. Mm -hmm. But there's so many good things, you know, like Ad, I would join Ada, Attitude, all these places are great supports for women and 
with ADD. Um, there's a lot of good things out there. And then look at your so, local communities too, you know, for chat groups or ADD support groups for adults. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one woman asked, since my diagnosis, I have had a problem renegotiating my relationship with my significant other. It's asking him to change so my needs are better met. Suppose he doesn't want to change or says he wants to leave. So there's a certain element of, you know, uncertainty about about sort of renegotiating things in your life right. once you have had a diagnosis. So I don't know what advice you'd mm -hmm. have for her. Well, there's a whole, I would, if I was reading my book, I have two books, but the one, it's funny, from women, maybe you're saying that because you read it, but I have three R's in there, and one of them is about renegotiating your relationships. The other ones are restructuring your life and redefining your self-image. But So there's a whole lot in there about renegotiating relationships, because once you do find yourself and know what you want, you then there's this whole other world out there of people that you have to deal with. And so that's good. That's the first step is knowing, you know, what's going on with you. And then there's it's all about it's a lot about boundary setting and about communication, knowing what you need. And women with ADD are afraid, very afraid that it's hard to evaluate your relationship in terms of divorce or separation even if you're in a really bad relationship because people women with ADD have compensated so much with sometimes they're getting help from their husbands or they're getting some structure or they're getting stuff that they're afraid they won't be able to make it on their own as strong and confident women with ADHD. So that clouds the picture when you're trying to make decisions about your relationship. And so first you have to get a, to a point of understanding that the, you know that that can't be part of it. You have to evaluate your marriage first, as if you didn't have ADD, and then you can put in that piece, like how will you compensate for that? But you don't want to stay in a really toxic relationship. So I don't know if that's your case, but it's usually not. It's usually something that once you understand your own ADD, you can often go for if you can't do it on your own and ask for what you need and communicating clearly what you need. After you know that, you need to often have couples counseling so that you can learn to communicate in a in a respectful, neutral way. You know, so many women with ADD feel like they can't communicate with their husbands because they 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 feel like it's like a court of law and, and it's like, okay, every issue is like, is this right or is this wrong? As if there's a jury to be decided rather than communicating in a way that's just clarifying how you feel, understanding how the other person feels and having respectful communication, whether you have ADHD or not. So often you get flooded by by issues that have wounded you years ago and your husband's, you know, just the opposite and you start to polarize positions. So things that attracted you maybe or that could help you each other that you could have contributed get polarized and one becomes right, one becomes wrong, good or bad, parent, child. So you need to really, you know, often seek some couples counseling from someone who has hopefully had some experience dealing with ADHD in couples, or at least respects that process and respects you as a person with ADHD. What you don't want to do is go into couples therapy where it's all about, you know, your husband and what you're, you know, as if he's right and that and your failures, you know, where you're just getting pushed to to work harder and harder. So you really want to be careful about the person you go to for couples counseling. But that's my advice. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, that's good advice. Uh Mary asks, um, I try to maintain the mask of competency every day, but I feel exhausted and drained at the end of the day because I'm not wired to do the things that neurotypical women do with so much less effort. How do I tell my children and husband that I can't be the default task handler because I'm just not cut out for it? I mean, yeah, that's the whole thing right there. It's exhausting. I mean, this mask of competency. We want to get away from masks and we want to find out how you really are competent so you can be authentically there with people. You're not, it, it separates you so much from even your family to have a mask on, obviously, to, and you, and you have competencies that, that are in other areas, perhaps. So you don't have to just spend all your time pretending to be competent in areas that you're not competent in because it's not helping anybody. It's not helping you. It's not helping them. And sometimes you need to divide up tasks, restructure your life so that they're doing different things, that there's maybe getting help from someone else to do some of these things where you go off and find something that you're really competent at. And this 
is about, you know, getting to that point of feeling strong enough to be able to be vulnerable, to be able to say, I'm not good at this. And I can't, you know, I'm not willing, you have to get to a place of I'm not willing to do this anymore. Your default can't be, okay, I just have to keep going and be on a treadmill and, and take care of everybody else's needs, even though it's killing me. It's not helping anybody. And it's not modeling to your children that, hey, nobody's perfect. We all have to find out what we're good at and what we're not good at and find out how to trade and to help each other. So you, if you can just even think of it as modeling, I'm having these difficulties. This is what I'm doing to get help. This is what I do to, to uh, you know, to support myself. Then, because that's going to help them rather than them becoming people who are perfectionistic and anxious and, and feeling like they can't fail or, or can't and have to do everything perfectly. So mm -hmm. so that's what I would say. You don't have you, you are competent in other areas. So find out what you're competent in and then you don't have to wear this mask. One last question. Um, Lucy asks, I am thirty five and I have this perfectionistic tendency that prevents me from going after uh, success. I feel like there's a hiccup along the way. If things don't go smoothly, there's something wrong with me. I, I tell myself, there I go again. Can you help me see my faulty logic? Could you just say that one more time, Wayne? I'm sorry. My attention was dying by the end of the hour. <laughs> okay. Uh, but woman... I admit that I have this weakness. Okay. <laughs> I'm modeling. <laughs> This woman has a perfectionistic tendency that prevents her from continuing to go after her big dreams. And if there's a hiccup along the way, if things don't go smoothly, she feels like there's something wrong with her. She tells herself, uh, here I go again. Can you help me see my faulty logic? How do I overcome this? Yeah, well, like I said before, you have to move from a model of perfection to wholeness. And you know, women are... You have to, this is a longer uncovering with somebody that can help you figure this out. What's behind this? What's the fear? You have to sort of maybe keep a journal of, of this fear and the anxiety that happens when you when you feel that that perfect image is being shattered. And so many people, whether it's women, whether it's your body or your brain or your goals, are so prone these days to all these media messages and social media. And, and you just feel so examined and so easily uncovered that maybe whatever is giving that whatever is continuing to feed that message you know you grow up absorbing it but these days if you're if you're around people or social media or other messages or family members where is that who's where's that still being fed from if it's not all internal and try to maybe find some new people to be with or new messages or new ways that you can find that are very centering you know look at mindfulness find ways that you can stop being so externally focused and, and taking in all those messages because there's always somebody that's better than us at something. There's always some way that we could improve and that's not helping us being centered and being um, comfortable with who we are. So I, I probably have to work with somebody or find a group or find other friends or turn off whatever negative messages are coming in at you. And, you know, might need to talk to a therapist about this if it's really holding you back from, you know, taking those risks that you need and that risk you need to let yourself be vulnerable to be close to people as well as to achieve your dreams. Very quickly, sorry, I want to sneak one more in. How does how do did someone find an ADHD coach? Several people have asked that. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not a coach, but I mean there's a few people yeah. that I really like that I feel are really well trained that can focus on you as a person and help you move toward your dreams as well as help you understand the ADD difficulty part of that. So, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. I, I might be able to refer you or I don't know, there's probably directories out the ACO is an organization that specializes in coaches, right? David's, uh, what's that, ADCA? I mean, there's a lot of places that specialize in coaching. Attitude probably has a directory, don't you, of coaches? Yes. Yes, we do. We have the attitude directory. If anything occurs to you, um, any good organizations, uh, you can send them to us, and then we can send them to the group who participated today. Is so, there a way for me to? Is there a group that I could send? Well, if somebody wants well, to, well, if you send it to me. us, okay. If you send it to us, we'll be able to get it to all the people right. who participated. Right. 
I just like people to be able to reach out to us because I just get so excited when I hear all these hundreds of people out there with these questions okay. that everybody shares. And I, my goal is to always try to find a way to reach you again. Okay. So, uh, well, then they can reach you at your website. Yeah, right? they can reach Sarah me Sarah at They have a contact form, but I'll put you on my mailing list if you do that. And then when we do a webinar or in person thing, I'll know where you are and I can let you know. What, what's happening okay. if we do something online, okay? Because it was great talking yeah. to all of you, even though I couldn't hear you. That's great. Well, that was terrific, Sari. I really appreciate it. Inspiring and empowering, I think. Thank you. Um, okay, it's great to be with you. So, have a great day, and and hopefully we'll get you back. Okay, um, well, bye, everybody. <laughs> And we're grateful to all of you for listening in. Don't miss the last ADHD Awareness Webinar tomorrow by Kirk Martin. It's called Positive Parenting Strategies, and it promises to be a good one. So see you then, and have a good day.